There's all kinds of good stuff in there. It's too bad I have to get a long sermon. Uh, <laughs> uh, amen. As for announcements, uh, hey, glad we brought that up. Lunch at 4 o'clock. And um, if you haven't signed up, you want to bring something, the list is out there. If you don't have something to bring, just come anyways, all right? I think there's enough food. Just bring yourself, yeah. There's plenty of food. All is good. That's at 4 o'clock. And then this week, uh, there is no grief care. And there is no midweek Bible study this week. And so it's true about Greek care. I remember we said that. And then Thursday night, which is Thanksgiving, we won't have our Bible study. And I'm assuming the ladies won't get together Thursday as well. So I think you'll be at home with your families. Yes. <laughs> and so that's this week will be pretty quiet. So but if you need something, please call the office. My cell phone. <laughs> Whatever that cell phone is, is my office. <laughs> I just thought about that through the office. <laughs> it's called my leash. <laughs> so sometimes it's my car, sometimes it's my kitchen. It just depends where that phone is. <laughs> so you know it's nearby. <laughs> uh, Bill's homesick. Pray for him. He texted me he's not feeling good this morning. Either. So Joyce is caring for him. So praise God. Well, we're. I'm going to read out of Proverbs 19 this morning. And you're going to have men's on Friday? Men's on, uh... They had some things to do. You want to be Friday? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll be there Friday. I'm As a lady's in a black truck. I'm looking for that lady the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we will meet Friday at Hardy's, yes. As the rest of you are going to have Black Friday shopping, we're just going to Hardy's ourselves. <laughs> I'm not that Black Friday shopping. <laughs> My shop is called Amazon. <laughs> well, Kim and I got hooked because we would go to Chewy's in Richmond and order all our presents at Chewy's. It was a wonderful thing. <laughs> we like Christmases at Chewy's. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> our kids are like, you just go there because you like Chewy's. Yeah, but hey. So they and bought presents at the same time. It was really good. All right, so we're in Proverbs 19. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge, and he sins who hastens with his feet. The foolishness of a man twists his way, and his heart frets against the Lord. Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his friend. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. Many entreat the favor of the nobility, and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. All the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. He who gives wisdom loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find good. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies shall perish. Luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a servant to rule over princes. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and the contentious contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. And the contentions of a wife, oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers. But a prudent wife is from the Lord. But a prudent wife is from the Lord. Shoot on the way. Thank you. Laziness casts one into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of his ways will die. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, 
and he will pay back what he has given. Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. A man of great wrath will suffer punishment, for if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. Listen to counsel and receive instruction, that you may be wise in your later days. There are many plans in a man's heart, nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. What is desired in a man is kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. A lazy man buries his hand in the bowl, and he will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Strike a scoffer, and the simple will become wary. Rebuke one who has understanding, and he will discern knowledge. He who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. A disreputable witness scorns the justice and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. Judgments are prepared for scoffers, and beatings for the backs of fools. Lord bless the reading of his word.
Eze, which means king in Igbo, Nigerian language. But we um, we just sing Jesus um, in the chorus. So um, just thought I would explain that to y'all.
Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Head of office, we're all. Yeah. Every cotton picking up the piece of it. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This world has nothing for me. All I want is Jesus. I wrote basically pretty. It's just stuff. A lot of us at that age are like, why do we gather all this stuff? <laughs> it's like, we're younger. Just give me stuff. I'm like, give it all away. Just give me Jesus. <laughs> you can have all my stuff. Give me Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All this, what's that? Benedict's truck. For a second one, Benedict's truck. He comes up, I drop into my house, and Benedict goes, Pa, Pa, I like your truck. <laughs> <laughs> Those are cool tires, Pa, Pa. People, too. You just try to get my truck when you're older, aren't you? You got it, man. <laughs> First in line. <laughs> Nothing like being grandpa, huh? Love it. Love being grandpa. Amen. Wow. Let's take up our offering and then we'll get into our teaching. All of this season's upon us. We got today's lunch and then December 2nd, which is Friday, uh, Friday evening. We're going to have a Christmas concert here with Bill Burt from Lake Anna. He does a Christmas concert, like a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of Christmas songs and Christmas carols, because it's kind of half and half with the guitar that has a little band. He has a guy, Santa, comes out, passes out candy and stuff, and so it's a good time. We'll have a Christmas concert with Bill Burt. And so we'll have a dessert that night, so bring stuff for desserts, and we'll enjoy our time together. And then on the 18th, which is the, the Saturday or Sunday before Christmas, the, the youth and the children are going to have a Christmas program for us. So that's going to be good. That will be our church service. And so and maybe we'll have a hot cider or something that morning. We'll figure something out. All right, brother. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can be here in your presence. Yes. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here in the nice cool cold and, and sunny, but it's just so beautiful. Yes. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we can be here. We pray for those that were not able to be here. Thank you for those who were able to give and those who were not able to give. Yeah. Father, bless each and every one of our lives for you as we live for you. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We miss our brother Maurice. Yes. He's a godsend. You know, we had Dave Beeler. But man, what are we going to do with that Dave? Well, he was Maurice. Wow, double blessing, man. It's like, this is sweet. <laughs> so, faith to Maurice. So, praise God. And, um, but back to the Christmas Day, the uh, kids would do a program that morning, uh, the 18th before Christmas, and at uh, 4 o'clock we'll have our, um, our, our party. What's it called? White Elephant. White Elephant. Yes, yes. And that can be pretty brutal. So. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a big spiral ham and just bring fixings for that for dinner and kind of like finger foods so we can kind of have the chairs in a circle so it's like we'll have ham ham sandwiches and stuff and just kind of finger foods that was easier to sit in a circle so I'm going to put tables up because we want to have time to go at each other we have tables in the way we need space to kind of just wrestle on the floor yeah <laughs> no more beer <laughs> it's a good time. <laughs> and then Christmas Eve, um, if you want to sing or do a special music that night, let us know. Um, we'd love to hear our talented to share some Christmas carols. If you want to sing a song or play a flute, whatever you want to do, harp, support, my friend, or whatever, no, no. <laughs> play something for the Lord that night, okay? So that'd be good. That'd be good. So, amen. Isn't God awesome? All the time. I have a brother up in. Um, Buffalo, New York. It's Calvary Chapel, Buffalo. They got six feet of snow this week. Wow. Actually, 77 inches right down the street from the Buffalo Bills play. Can you imagine 77 inches? Yeah. And the thing is, it's so cold there, it's not going anywhere. They just push it to the side, it stays there for the next couple months. That's the hard part about that area. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Unless it's salted. So it's like, wow. It's, it's just. 
He's moving down to Virginia, actually, this guy is. His um, public home. He, um, it's, it's funny because his daughter, uh, he's a pastor up there, and his daughter um, moved to a town called Bumpus. And we were at, I was at a pastor's gathering. He's like, hey, my daughter, she lives in the little town of Virginia. You may have heard of it. Have you ever heard of the town Bumpus? I'm like, I live in Bumpus. <laughs> you live there? Wow, I didn't think anybody lived in Bumpus. Yeah, that's where I live. <laughs> it's like, all right, so he comes down. Well, he has seven grandkids down there, so he's down here all the time. So grandkids are like magnets. <laughs> and so he comes down, so I see him all the time. But I texted him yesterday, how's that snow going? He goes, we're coming down to Virginia. More than just the grandkids, it's just this weather. Woo. All right, well, we are in James chapter 5. We're trucking along. We're going to be verses 7 through 12. Last week, we got our, um, we got kicked around a little bit about greed. That wasn't fun. He kind of chewed us up, spit us out, and shoe fits, deal with it. He kind of basically, don't be greedy. He's talking to those in the church not to be greedy. So then we got his message about that. And so we see in verses 7 through 12 is interesting because it's more fitting now than ever of what he's talking about here. Um, the first statement there says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. <coughs> be patient according to the coming of the Lord. Now, I was thinking about, I was kind of put my, my head, I want to read this a little bit, but I was putting my head in the head of these new Christians in this early, early church in Jerusalem. And uh, James is the first book written in the New Testament. It wasn't Matthew, in case you were wondering, but it was actually the book of James. It's the earliest book written. So Matthew came later on down the road. But um, James was uh, a disciple, and his whole teaching was to the church in Jerusalem. So a bunch of Jewish Christians, what we call Messianic Jews. They're the Jews who've given their hearts to Christ. And so so first thing he says to them is, be patient regarding the coming of the Lord. Well, just realize they just saw the Lord leave. And they just, a lot of them firsthand had a relationship with the Lord. They walked with him. They talked with him. They saw his miracles. And they're just like, man, this Jesus guy is awesome. And so when he left, it was like, you can't leave us. And so when, for him to say, I'm coming back, they're like, when are you coming back? This place is a mess. That was thousands and thousands of years ago. And so, but at that time, they're like, where is he at? And so they're anticipating his coming at the very beginning of the church. They were anticipating his coming. And they're dealing with impatience. And so just kind of have this, this is kind of who we're talking about. And the, but how is it fitting with us today? You know? Uh, the world's falling apart. Uh, you read the Revelation, you study Revelation, it's all like winding up that we can tell. It's like, man, is he coming soon? And, and how many times have we said, Maranatha, Lord? Like, which means, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I probably said Maranatha more this year than any year of my life. I think I'm getting impatient. So this passage has been right to me, because this year I've been pretty impatient. Like, what are you waiting for? Bring it on. So we get, and then we get this attitude of impatience. We're going to talk about that. What does it look like in our daily walk, and how does it affect us negatively when we get impatient with his return? Because we want to give up. You know, when Kim passed away, I got kind of jaded. Like, Lord, did it help my wife? And I struggled with that. And then the Lord, you know, I just thought you would come by the time Trump was out of office. I thought for sure you're going to come by that point. <laughs> Here it is two years later. He still hasn't come. I'm like, well, come on, Lord. And, you know, I'm a visionary type guy. At least I was until the last couple of years. I just, because of my impatience, I didn't lost my want to even vision. It's affected me in a negative way. And then when we get impatient, we get grumpy. We get irritable with people around us. And is that what God wants for us? No. How can I be a light and a salt if I'm impatient, if I'm irritable, if I don't have a heart for the lost? You know, I, was, I, was, I was losing that compassion even for the lost. I was just ready to go home. You know, I'm just like, I think we all can be there at times. And, and when we get tired... Grumpy, we just get where it's just kind of more self focused. We talked about that greed last week, but it's, he's kind of that's what he's talking about. And I think it's really more fitting today than ever. So I was like, wow, shoes fit way too much this week. 
<laughs> so he says, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and later rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren. Test, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. The door, get me right there. <laughs> oh, I always looked away. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord an example, as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, lest you fall into temptation. Father, I pray you just bless our reading, bless our studying, our examining, our applying, and seeing if the shoe fits. This is what we're dealing with. And I think we all are, Father, because we're human. But help us to take this to heart this morning. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Therefore, be patient. Anyone here have a problem with being patient? You know, you, you go to the grocery store, and you, there's like all these full lines, you pick the shortest line, and the, the longest person who just takes forever, one piece at a time, you're just like, you ever get frustrated there? And you stand behind that one person who watch all the other lines just going by you. He's like, how do I always pick the slow line? <laughs> Every time. And it was the shortest one, because everyone else knew, don't go in that line. <laughs> so we should learn that. Just if there's a short line, there's a reason that's the short line, right? But we get impatient. And traffic, man, who loves traffic? <laughs> we should never complain in this county about traffic. But we get behind a school bus or a tractor, and we complain. Oh, man, stupid school bus. Spent one day driving to the sea and back. That would change your whole process of thinking. Amen? Amen. That just, who wants to drive up there and back every day? But it's not, I, I, I love talking to people who do. They're like, man, that's my Bible time. I turn on the radio. I listen to teachings. I can listen to three sermons there and back. <laughs> it's like, they're in their traffic. That's the perspective to have, you know? It's like, I have so much time with God because I'm with traffic. Just, <laughs> but we get impatient. But he's talking about the impatience regarding the coming of the Lord. And again, this is where we all can be guilty of. I think of the, the disciples as Jesus ascended into heaven. And they're just like, whoa. And they just stood there gazing. And the angel said, okay, put your gazing, get back to work. We got work to do. Amen? Amen. Well, in, this, in these last days, you know, we, we, look, we look at the prophecy stuff, we look at the current events, and, and I get, get wrapped up in this stuff. And sometimes I lose focus of my work today because I'm thinking, we're going home tomorrow. Woo! -hoo! And I, and I forget we have a job to do today. So I get impatient, and my impatience affects my life, affects my attitude. It affects how I am around people. I get intolerant. I get irritable. The man, he's not coming. What's wrong with you, God? Why aren't you coming? And I love how our sister Annabelle brought up because of his mercy and his grace, he's waiting for one more soul to come. Can you imagine if he came before you were saved? And you missed it by one person. It's going to be that day. One time, it's going to be that one. And that one person just missed it by that. And when he comes, boom. But praise God, none of us had to face that. Amen. We got saved before his return. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. But we get impatient. And so he says, uh, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Waiting patiently for it until he it receives the early and later rain. Farmers are patient. I had a garden. 
on my, my back deck two summers ago. And I planted the seeds. I got the, all these buckets. I got all the soil. And I, got, I planted these plants and seeds and waited. Well, they said, the, the almanac said, because it was a colder uh, spring, that it would, it would come out in July rather than June. I'm like, this is May. I'm like, i got to wait till July before I see any fruit. So that, that was two months were the warmest months ever. I got there, come on, plants, hurry up. It was just, just it, before you know it, some pops out of the soil. <gasps> Where's the tomatoes at? I'm like, that was a lot of work. That was a lot of money. And there's a, a t and by the time it showed up, the plants produced like a third of what they're supposed to produce. I was like, ah, in a rage. <laughs> well, welcome to farming. <laughs> I know many people who plant tomatoes and they're the very, very wet summers and nothing comes out. It's just, sometimes it's too much water and that happens a lot here in Virginia. Yeah. Talk, to, talk to Steve Phillips, I mean, that's farm. He's just, that's just dealing with bugs and too much rain and, or not enough rain. Or, but the farmer waits patiently. He plants his stuff in the ground and he, you know, he tills it, he weeds it, he fertilizes it. And basically, he waits. But while he's waiting, he's working. He's working on the future of gardens. He's working on this garden. He's, he's keeping the critters out of the garden. He's keeping the bugs out of the garden. He's, he's done everything he can to keep it healthy because he wants to have fruit. But he doesn't stop. He doesn't let his impatience keep him from doing the work of a farmer. Because if he just stood there and said, I give up. I planted the seeds yesterday, and today nothing happened. And he gave up. He says, I'm not doing anything until I see something pop out of the ground. Next thing he knows, he sees a bunch of grass come up. And go, go, you know, he sees weeds come up. He sees a bunch of bugs out there. All of a sudden, the crows all over the, the produce. Like, what's wrong with this place? Well, there's no, there's no vegetables. Because you're not doing the work that you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> so we get impatient, and it keeps us from doing the work of the Lord. So get excited about his coming back. Be excited that, yes, the intimacy, that he can come any time. But we can't let that make us impatient. We can't let that keep us from doing the work. We can't continue to gaze in the sky looking for his return. I, I think of uh, as they built the wall in Nehemiah. They had one weapon in one hand, and then they had the trough in the other hand. They watched the enemy, but they could just the whole time just hold a weapon and get nothing done. No, they had a weapon in one hand, the sword, and a trough in the other. So as they were working, they had the weapon in his other hand, just in case. Amen? Well, should we not be that way regarding the coming of the Lord? Yes, we're looking for his coming, but I'm working over here at the same time. When he comes as a thief in the night, he doesn't catch us doing nothing. He doesn't catch us agonizing over the condition of the world. He doesn't catch us irritable because we just thought you were coming, Lord. And being selfish about it. Now, what have we done this last year to spread the good news, personally? What have we done? How many people have we talked to? You know, I've talked about the rapture. I've talked about the come. But how many people have I shared about Jesus in this time? Not a whole lot. Some. I'm the pastor. Shame on me. But we should be more at work as we're looking for his coming. Amen? As the farmer. It's busy at work. Then it says in verse 8, you also be patient. Again, he's talking to you about the farmer. Now you be patient. The farmer's patient. You be patient. And with that, be busy at his work. Amen? Establish. He says establish. Wow. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I think of Noah. I think of when the Lord said, Noah, yes, Lord, <laughs> build me an ark. A what? You guess I'll build a what? For a hundred years, he kept preaching, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. You know he's human. Lord, when's it going to rain? <laughs> Come on. I've been doing this for 30 years now, Lord. It just started. <laughs> it's like, and so he had to establish himself that he couldn't give up, that he was grounded in God, that he 
his whole life, his heart was committed, established in God. It's like marriage. When you get married, you, you commit yourself to that spouse no matter what. I remember when I put that ring on my hand. And I committed my life to Kim. Now, there is no other. And when that ring went on, that was a promise to God. That was a promise to her mom and her dad. And a promise to her that there will be nobody else. I committed my heart. I committed my mind. I committed my body to be her husband and nobody else's. So I got established. We were an established couple. And no matter what storms came our way, no matter what things came our way, it doesn't matter. We were committed to each other. Well, no, he was established with God in a sense when the world came at him, when he got just ridiculed, when his, you know, just when his neighbors mocked him and, and nobody wanted to follow him. And, you know, the devil worked in his head, I'm sure his own flesh question and I'm sure he doubted he was human who wouldn't doubt like man I'm building this boat no one even knows what a boat is and I don't know what rain is and people think I'm crazy some conspiracy theory going on here right well this conspiracy theory was accurate that first day when it rains like oh boy all of a sudden everybody wanted to know it but he was gone he was in the boat he was in the ark he was nowhere to be in touch with. It was too late. The Lord's coming. Yeah. You gotta be patient. You gotta be patient. Noah told as many people as he could. His kids followed, but not many followed him. But you gotta be established. I think of Jesus' disciples. You know, how many of them had good lives to the very end? They were persecuted, they were hung, they were, was John was boiled in the oil. I mean, these guys suffered to the very end. But they were established. You think of the prophets. You know, and then he goes on to the next verse, he says, um, in verse, verse 9, he says, Do not grumble, we're ahead here. But verse 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren. Lest you be condemned, behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, I think in, in context here, the grumbling has a lot to do with what's going on around us. And how many times we come to church, we talk about the gas prices, we talk about the government, we talk about the taxes, we talk about the weather, uh, the weather, we talk about, we, we kind of grumble. You know, and how much time do we spend talking about the gas prices? Oh, uh, and the food prices. And that's a fact of life. Everything's in, we're all in the same boat, literally in the same boat. But what are we spending our time on? Grumbling or praising God? Now James talks about the tongue. Do we use his tongue for <coughs> praising him or cursing God? But he says it's very clear. Don't grumble one another to one another, about one another, especially about things around us. I think about Israel when they got out of Egypt. Man, they, they're in bondage, they were in Egypt, they were slaves, and they prayed and prayed and prayed that God would bring them a deliverer, and Moses came on the scene, and the Lord delivered them out of the bondage and the miracles they saw in the process, they saw the frogs and the blood, the water turned to blood, the lice, the boils, and, and the list goes on, all the stuff that God did to get Pharaoh's attention, and then all of a sudden, the, the, the Lord said, okay, we're going to kill, you if you don't you know, put the blood on the, the front, the, the top of the door and the sides, and with the lamb's blood, you're going to lose your firstborn. And so those who did that, their, their son was, was saved. And those who didn't, including Pharaoh, they lost their son. And that was the last straw that broke, that broke the camel's back. And Pharaoh said, just, just get out of here. And the people saw God do this miracle, and he, he delivered them out of Egypt. Like, Wow! Look what God did. This is so awesome. Who would have thought that hard heart of Pharaoh would actually give in? And he did. And then Pharaoh chased him across the desert, across the Red Sea. And next thing you know, the Red Sea was opened up and, and each uh, Israel went through and dry land. And like, wow. And then Pharaoh came after them and the, the water swallowed them up. Like, holy cow, can you imagine all that stuff? And after all that stuff happening, God's provided in the desert, and they're in a, they're in a, they're in a bump of the road where they're getting a little hungry. And they just started grumbling. Oh, 
I wish we're back in Egypt. Oh, we had it so better in Egypt. And God's like, excuse me? <laughs> Moses, aren't people grumbling? <laughs> what God think about that? <laughs> He's, your people are messed up. I'm going to go after them. Moses like, no, 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 it's okay. Just give him a chance, give him a chance. And the Lord gave him redemption as he left up serpent in the wilderness. As it says, even so must the son of man be lifted up. The Lord, in his mercy and grace, in spite of their grumbling, those who turned to him were saved. But God hates grumbling. He made it very clear here not to grumble. So in his last days, he doesn't want us to be impatient. He doesn't want us, you know, to fret over the timing. But he also doesn't want us to complain about it. What's going on around us? Amen. Don't do it, he says. Don't grumble. But don't grumble against, especially with one another, brother, lest you are condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, I don't believe this is a con condemnation that those who sin and who don't have Jesus, they get condemned to hell. I think this is more a condemnation as a father disciplines his child and because he loves him. The father doesn't go, hey, hey, he's here to get your attention. Knock it off. But praise God for the grace of Jesus. We've been saved. Amen. Our sins have been forgiven. But he's still going to discipline us. He's still going to get our attention. He's, hey, hey, church, knock it off. Your church has lost your blessing because y'all sitting around complaining and grumbling all the time. How's that going to help your church? Knock it off. So Jesus, he's the pastor of our church. I'm not the pastor. I'm the under pastor. He's the pastor. He's like, hey, you guys are grumbling. Knock it off. You want to be blessed? You want to grow spiritually and grow together? Quit your grumbling, he says. Amen. So if that's if, if the shoe fits, and we all have our issue, deal with it. Amen. Enough said and grumble. <laughs> Unless you grumble against me. You stop too much about it. <laughs> um, my brethren, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. These prophets stood by themselves in the wilderness. Jeremiah, man, he, he preached and preached and preached and preached and nobody would come in and take heed to what he was preaching. Lamentations is called the book of the weeping, weeping prophet because nobody would take heed but he didn't give up. He was established in his relationship with God. And not that he didn't struggle. He was human. He, he said, oh my God, I've been preaching and preaching and preaching. And they persecuted him. They harassed him. They ridiculed him. They, I mean, he, he went through hell of that. Not literally, but just a lot of just hardships for the sake of standing for God. And tell the people, guess what? You're going to lose all of this because of your stupidity. You're going to go to captivity. And we're going to lose the temple. We're going to lose all of this to Babylon. And they hated what he had to say, but what he said was the truth. But he withstood, and the Lord blessed him. Amen. The Lord gave him the power. And the Lord blessed him. And they said, look at them as an example, as the others. Other prophets, and read, read about the other prophets and how they stood for God. And what they had to say. And it wasn't popular what they had to say. But it was the truth. There's a lot of TV preachers on today who like to tickle ears. And man, you can hear a lot of fun stuff out there. But all of a sudden, you get a preacher out there, he's just preaching the word. And this church is kind of small. And maybe some of them aren't big, but the majority of the big churches are the pastors are tickling ears. And they want to fill their big kingdoms up, all the money and stuff. But there's some good guys out there. I love David Jeremiah. Man who teaches the word. Amen. Amen. Love his voice. Most of that pastor Jeremiah's voice. <laughs> he just sounds like a preacher, man. He's awesome. <laughs> um, but I thank God for them. I thank God for the ministries. But again, it's about the word, it's about the truth. And they wouldn't, it's not a popular thing. Many churches are going woke today. And they're caving into the, the, the society that's around them. Guys, that's not what the Bible talks about. They, need, they do need to wake up, but not in that way. Amen? Amen. And I think YouTube just knocked me off. 
Oh, well, they're on YouTube for a season, but I think what I just said is probably got knocked off. But truth is truth. Amen? Amen. We're not going to wake up that way. We've got to wake up to God and be established in Him. That's what it's all about. So again, we, we, we look at the, these, these prophets. Um, and then they said, they spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and impatience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endured. You have heard of these perseverance of Job. Wow, you talk about perseverance. <laughs> But Job lost his kids. He, he, he lost his wealth. He lost his properties. He lost it all. But one thing he didn't lose is his faith. His own wife told him, "There's God and die. Come on, Job. Your faith is ridiculous. Like, what is wrong with you? You have the faith in God, but you're going to let all this stuff to happen. And, and she tried to make him turn. No, no, no. My, my faith in God is keeping it all together. Amen. And he was established in God. He was fixed on God. He, you know, James talks about the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's tossed to and fro from one doctrine to another. But today I believe in God. Today I believe in myself. Tomorrow I don't know what I believe in. Just kind of go back and forth. Well, uh, it just depends how I feel. Oh, I didn't have caffeine today. Oh, forget that. You got my coffee, I'm happy. But we're unstable when we're double-minded. But when we're established and we're fixed, and that's how Job was. He had this relationship with God. Even his friends harassed him. Right now, I have a very, very, very close friend on his deathbed. He's been my... Um, Disciple, you can come in here anytime I have an issue come up in the church or just and it's something exciting. I always call Jim Dowling, he's out in California. I lived with him before I went to Bible college, and with, while I was living with him, I felt the Lord call me to ministry. And then I went to Bible school from his house, and he sent me with his blessing to Arizona College of the Bible to be to pursue the ministry. And my whole time there, I would call my my spiritual dad, Jim. Hey, Jim, man, college is good. I learned this about ministry. We're doing this. And all the time here, the ups I shared about and the downs I shared about. I always called Jim, man, man, I have a tough week. Can you pray for me? He's always been there as a friend. And he's Because he's established. He was fixed in God. He was always my, um, just that one dear person who just helped me in my time here as your pastor. And, I, and he's... I mean, I've been raising support for the help and support. He's always supported me from day one. I always sent money just to bless the church, to bless us. From day one, he's the number one supporter. And I just, his heart has been here to just be with us. I just thank God for Jim. Well, his son called me on Friday in California. I'm like, ooh, why are you at the home in California? That's not a good sign. Well, dad's on his deathbed. I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, no. Not Jim. No. But he's had a full life for God. He, he can't wait to go home. He, he knows it's time. He has his peace because he knows Jesus. I just don't want him to go. <laughs> I've always picked up the phone and called him. Like, no, you can't leave me, man. Like, yeah, I can't even call him now. His, his mind's not there. And it's just like, no. Oh, I know where he's at. <laughs> his mind is with God. He's established with God. Amen. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Job was established with God. No matter what came at him, his faith did not waver. And then we see that God blessed him immensely. Now, yes, he lost his family, but the Lord blessed him with a new family, double, double portion of everything. The Lord blessed him and blessed him and blessed him. And it displayed God's mercy and grace. I was reading Chuck Smith about on this passage, and one thing he just the only thing he really said about this verse was God's mercy and grace. No matter who you are, God's mercy and grace is for you. No matter how big, how small, how smart, how dumb, how rich, how poor, it don't matter. God's mercy and grace is for you. Amen. That's his mercy because none of us deserve it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be mercy and grace. It's God's gift to us. Oh, I deserve the grace from God. No, you don't. It's not grace then. 
That means you earned his favor. That is not grace anymore. Amen? But we, we, we see Job as he received God's mercy and grace. Or it says here, the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. That's his love. His compassion and merciful on Job. And that's what he wants for us. So be patient. God wants you to see his compassion and mercy. Amen? That's where his heart is. That's God's heart is to show you his compassion and mercy. As a father, I have 20-year-old sons, and I just keep praying for compassion and mercy for them, from me. You know, sometimes I just want to be the law guy. Thus saith dad. But the Lord says, compassion and mercy, compassion and mercy, compassion and mercy. Remember, Dave, you received my compassion and mercy. Dish it out. Compassion and mercy. Amen. Mm -hmm. And thank God for his compassion and mercy. And then verse 12, and it says, above all, above all the other stuff I said, listen to this. Above everything else, listen to this. He says, my brethren, do not swear. Either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Test your, um, lest you fall into judgment. My eyes tear up, I can't read. Our word is a powerful thing. What we say, do we back it up with action? When we tell people we love them, do they believe us? No, we didn't. We went through the election season, and it's just like it's hard to believe what they tell us. Like, oh yeah, like whatever. You know, we've always said that joke. You know, when a politician is lying, it's when their mouth moves. Right? Okay, well, lying. But do they say that about us? Are right, we tell our kids, "I love you"? Mm -hmm, sure, Dad. Mm -hmm. I'll do anything for you. Mm -hmm. And my kids think that, that's my problem. I need to change that. You know, as, as Christians, I want us to be able to trust each other. Hey, I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. Never had it before. Now, why are you saying that now? That's just a catchphrase. Oh, that's what you're paid to say. But do you really mean it? Then call me anytime, but you never answer the phone. Oh, I answered that phone. You just said call me anytime. I didn't say I would answer every time. You had to say call me every time. <laughs> Don't you hate the temptation we have when someone calls you and it tells you who's calling? You're like, that's nobody here. And that temptation's there. Or the temptation, hey, my, oh, I lost my phone call. And you just hit conveniently just hit off and actually you, you turn the phone call off? Anybody else do that here? <laughs> this is true confession time. Don't do that. Don't treat each other that way. Amen. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. We're in a time today where people's word means nothing. Remember when we were kids, you say, hey, I promise, but you have your fingers crossed behind your back. <laughs> and that promise meant nothing. Oh, I didn't mean it because my fingers are crossed behind my back. So you know, I promise. No fingers crossed, but still, I ain't going to do it. Shame on us. Let our yes be yes, and our no be no. Especially when we make promises to God. You think he wants us to be serious? You know, when we make a marriage vow, God, I promise I will never leave this lady. And this, this whole land, how many divorces do we see? And did that promise mean nothing to you and God? Did we not make that promise to God? To sickness, to poor, to rich, or poor, my vow to you, my vow to the church, my vow to God that I will never leave or forsake this person. Oh yeah, how many divorces do we see in our land in the church? There's, there are just as many churches in the church as there's outside the church. God doesn't like that. Amen? Amen. And again, I'm not saying... God doesn't forgive because that's not the unforgivable sin. But it still doesn't please God. 
God will still forgive you. So don't, don't hear that, oh, Dave, man, God won't. No, he'll forgive you. He forgives all sin, amen? Except the rejection of the Holy Spirit. That's the sin he will not forgive. That ultimately, that's a rejection of salvation. But God wants us to be people of truth. Man, what a, what a great testimony we have when we tell our boss the truth. I love my job. I've shared this many times. Mrs. Kincaid, I walked into their office after I broke a piece of furniture. And all the guys said, don't tell Mrs. Kincaid because she's hard. She's mean. You'll tell her she'll be all over you. So Mrs. Kincaid, and she's like, yes. <laughs> Can I help you? Uh, 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 I broke a piece of furniture. Really? I was backing up the thing and I bumped it and I, I'm so sorry. And she just smiled at me. Thank you. I have a guy back there, he will repair it. I, that's his job. But what you did is just be honest to me. I love that. <laughs> I walk back to the warehouse. It's like, guys, I'm off the hook. What'd you do, lie to her? No, I told her the truth. <laughs> you told Mrs. Kincaid the truth? Yeah. I was an idiot and knocked over a piece of furniture. Didn't say it like that, but said it more nicer, made myself look a little better. But I still told her the truth. The truth pays. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it's okay to say no to someone. If someone asks you to do something, say, I, I can't do it. How many times we say, I can't tell them no because they might think ill of me. No, I think ill of you if you tell me you can't do it, and you can't, you lie to me. If you can't do it, you can't do it. It's okay to say no. You can't do everything. Well, I'll help you find someone who can and help them. Give them some directions or instructions or elsewhere to go. But don't say yes when you don't mean yes. Amen. That will help, that will hurt any relationship when we lie to each other. That's the world. That's how they treat each other. That's how the world, they're just anything to save themselves. They don't care. They don't care. But we are different people. We should care about the truth. God tells us the truth through his son. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by him. That's the truth. So if we're people of truth, shouldn't we live and act and talk like people of truth? Our, our word is powerful. When your boss says, be there at 8 o'clock, what time should you be at work? 8 o'clock. 7.45. Don't be there at 8.05. <laughs> Sometimes things happen. Call your boss. But do your best to be there before 8 o'clock. I love the Central Virginia. No, I'll be honest. I kind of like the Central Virginia working for them, but I love being out in the community. What I, that I didn't like is every Thursday I had to get to four and do a 15-hour route for 250 miles. That was brutal. But every Thursday, I was there no matter what. And the Central Virginia loved that I was there because I was always there. They never had a day when I wasn't there. They said, people don't do that anymore. We don't want anyone else but you because you, were, you, you always got the paper out no matter what. You always were there. Because that was my, my goal, was to always be there. I planned a mission trip, I planned kids camp. Every Thursday, I, I would cancel or quit everything up to Wednesday night, because Thursday morning, I had the paper up, no matter what. It was a consistency, and they just kept me, and I, I remember they wanted to dock my pay just because the, the company was hurt, and I said, no, I'm working for this much. If you want to find someone else, that's fine. Oh, no, no, we don't want anybody else. We'll keep your pay. Why? Because I was there. I was consistent. It was funny because they said their excuse was, well, the gas prices are so high, we just can't. I said, I pay the gas. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but let your yes be yes and your no be no. So this morning, his counsel to us is be patient. Amen? Be patient for the coming of the Lord. Like the farmer. And use the prophets and, and Job as your example. Be patient and be established in God and established in your faith where you're not going to be tossed to and fro back and forth. And then it says, don't grumble. Don't complain about the gas prices. Don't complain about the government. Don't complain about the aids going up. I mean, that's the fact of life. I mean, there's some comments, but don't spend your whole life. That's all we talk about. Let's talk about Jesus. Amen. Talking about, man, someone got saved over here. Woohoo! It's praise God. Amen? Amen. And those gas prices. <laughs> 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 but 
But don't, like, don't hover there and stay there all the time. Talk about Jesus all the time. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and then watch what you say. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. What an awesome testimony you could have. I can just trust our word. I promise. Or a handshake, that's all you have to do. A handshake, let's do it. Let's make a deal. That, that's old school. A handshake was a deal maker. But now it's like, eh, my fingers are crossed. <laughs> <laughs> That's called kid stuff. Maturity, walking with the Lord, we're serious. <coughs> I guarantee it. Amen? With God's help, we can back it up. Because what he said to you, because of Jesus, I guarantee you can be in heaven when you die. He says, I guarantee it. Amen? I guarantee it. That's Jesus. Let's do the same thing. Amen? Amen. Yeah, let's all stand. Four o'clock, guys. Ooh, yeah. Looking forward to come back here. Hey, if you can, once the service is over, we need three sets of two tables up. Two, four, six tables with nine chairs on either side. And the rest of the chairs can be pushed to the side. If you want to help out, we'd appreciate it. And then it's going to be done regardless, but if you can help out, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Um, so 4 o'clock back here for dinner, and um, just have a good time of fellowship. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your word. The blessing it is to be called your children. But God, help us to be patient. Help us to be established in you. Help us to, be, um, to continue to look at Job and the prophets and just thank you for your, your love and your mercy that you show them that you have for us. Help us not to grumble and help us to be truthful. Thank you, Father. We love you. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. 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 Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress, he's my deliverer, in him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock, he's my fortress, he's my deliverer, in him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Charlie. Old timer. Old timer. I not named I know. Can you pray for us, brother? Oh, we just love you. Thank you for this time together and your time to worship you. We ask you to bless your thank you today. Bless everyone here and see us home safely. In fact, that. Eat this afternoon. We just love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord bless you all. <laughs>